Bless the Lord, people of God. For the word says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. It says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for his mercy enduring forever. We have come today to give God a little bit of praise, to give this sacrifice of praise. And we thank him for giving us the opportunity to come together in the house of the Lord today. I don't know about you, but I stepped out and was kind of shocked at the precipitation this morning. I must have missed the news, but I began to think about through the storms and through the rain, we can say we made it. Through heartaches and through pain, we say we made it. And we don't care what the weather says on a Sunday morning, we're going to press our way to the house of the Lord. So I'm glad about the rain. Most of you know I love rain. Because rain lets me know that there's going to be a harvest. Because I planted some seed in the ground. So I pray to those who are with us in the building today. I say good morning. God bless you. To those who are watching on the different platforms, we welcome you to World Victory International Christian Center. We are located in, at 1414 Cliffwood Drive in the beautiful Piedmont City of Greensboro and in the state of North Carolina. We welcome you to come visit with us. We welcome you to have a, a wonderful experience because God resides here, he rests here, he hovers here, and we have a mighty move of God in the word. So we thank you. Our bishop is Bishop Adrian F. Starks. He's the angel of this house and Lady Starks, Pastor Starks, uh, pray over us and, and, and speak over our lives and hold us up when things might not be going well and cheer us on when things are going well. So we bless this house today. Our scripture reading is coming from Isaiah chapter 43. I, Isaiah is one of my favorite, favorite books of the Bible. And many of the things that you heard as a child when you were coming up as a Christian came from the book of Isaiah. But this is one that just arrested my spirit. It says, but now, I'm in the uh, New International Version, I think. But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Now Jacob and Israel are the same people. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Talking to you, World Victory, talking to you, visitors. Fear not, for I, the Lord, have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine, Edwina. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not burn, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And then I want to move to verse 5 to remind you, world victory, fear not, for I am with you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, no matter what step I take, no matter what step I'm on in this life, I have the blessed assurance that you are with me and I have nothing to fear. I praise you, Lord, for awakening us up this morning. I praise you, Lord, for getting us here safely on a day of unseen precipitation. I praise you, Lord, for having the mindset to come into the house of the Lord. I bring you glory today. Father, I pray that this atmosphere was set, be set for you to feel comfortable in this place. Move up and down the aisles. Move through the pews. 
move on the pulpit, move in the choir stand, be glorified in this place today. Somebody may have awakened, not feeling too well, God, but we know you as a healer. Somebody have lost their direction, but we know that you are the GPS of our lives. Somebody don't have the means today, but you said in your word that you are a provider. You are a banner over us. You see us. You hear us. You are El Rohi, and we thank you for that. You said in your word that you are the great I am, and we bless you for that. God, we pray that you will take charge of this service today, God. Reign and, and rule over us, God. Let no distractions come our way. Let no room for anything that's not in order to come in this house of the Lord today. And we give your name praise in Jesus' name. Put your hands together and give God praise. Put your hands together in expectation. Put your hands together to receive the Lord in the form of the praise team. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, family. Hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made, family. Hallelujah. Those that are here, those that are watching via stream, oh God, we know that you know us by name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love to call your great name. Hallelujah, oh God, oh God, oh God. Hallelujah, y'all know this, hallelujah. Hallelujah, yeah. Hey. Hey. 
hymns and spiritual songs that album actually taught me old school stuff stuff that I didn't know and he has a Jesus medley on there and the reprise says Jesus 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 you may not have all the gifting when you see minister Walter go and he flows in such a prophetic way but if you can just say, Jesus, you've got all that you need. I'm telling you, glory to God. We bless the name of the Lord this morning. Can you put your hands together one more time for that wonderful name of Jesus? I believe Mother Mungo, the song says, no other name under heaven can save us. Jesus, Jesus, Minister Walter. 
to no other name I know. He said there's power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. But then I remembered I'm in North Carolina. I had to make sure we ain't cancel anything. You know, a little bit of ice will cancel everything. So I'm happy that we're in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. That's our, our New York bishop probably wouldn't cancel for nothing. So uh, we're blessing the Lord uh, for just this wonderful weather this morning. Um, as we get into the word, I want you guys to... Um, to begin to prepare yourself, I'm going to read three passages of scripture just so we don't have to bounce around much during the sermon, and I'll let you guys know those things. Um, we're going to be Daniel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 1, and John chapter 21, and as you prepare to, to, to kind of put your thumb in those places, I want to uh, mention a couple things. Uh, first, I don't know if everyone knows, but we want to congratulate our very own MC on becoming a father. And I don't think everybody knows, so God bless you, your wife, and your precious baby. Let's give God some glory. Hallelujah. We are excited about it. Amen, amen, amen. Um, we also want you all to know, um, as you will be seeing in the next couple weeks, uh, as we go forward in services, one of the things we're going to try to do, we're trying to make sure our, our communication, we want to improve in every area of communication. And so what we've done is, uh, if media, if you're ready to put that up there, we have um, a QR code that we're going to be putting on the screen. If you have your phones with you and you're able to have a, you have a camera app that can read the QR code, what that QR code will do is it's going to take you to the announcements page on our website. And so throughout services at announcements, because we can't announce everything, we don't have the time to do everything, and so many things are going on. Everything that is recurring, whether it's men's ministry, men's ministry met yesterday, that's every second Saturday. Women's ministries every fourth Saturday. Justice centers every third Saturday. Um, young at Heart, these things that are, 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 Young at Heart is every second Saturday. These things that are repeating in, in our current events, if you use your phone and you put your camera up to that, it will take you to the website uh, via that QR code. And so what we want to do is do as many things that we can to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. We have new faces showing up, and we are so excited for God doing those things. And you should be able to see it everywhere in the sanctuary, from the screens uh, to the confidence monitor. Um, and so we bless God for that. If you were able to do that, um, you get a chance to go right there, and you can see the announcements. And so we want that to be made aware for everyone. I want to give a shout out to men's ministry. I was unable to attend, <clears throat> uh, not able to uh, get going in the morning a bit, um, feeling a little bit, uh, a little bit of recovery that was going on for me. Um, but I'm so excited to hear about how the men uh, got a chance to meet and discuss some things concerning our young men. And so I got a brief update earlier from Elder Sims, and I'm excited about how uh, God is going to use that conversation to be a blessing to our young men. I had no idea um, the conversation was facilitated by Pastor Roy. And if you follow sports, you may have been following this athlete, John ja Morant. I don't know if, you, if you're following what's happening in the NBA, but he's been suspended. He was... Um, 
on IG Live and he flashed a gun and they have a no guns policy and long story short, all I could see was the young men that we've served throughout the years. And when Elder Sims told me, I'm, I'm just like, oh my gosh, I was thinking the exact same thing. And it's not about who thinks it, it's God thinking it. And so I'm excited about what God is about to do in our midst on behalf of the community, on behalf of our young men. We thank God for Brother Lex and, and what he's doing with Build Something and other mentoring programs that are out there uh, for Deacon Kennard and what he's doing with his boxing and getting a chance to sow into young men. It's, there's a great need in the, in the earth right now. There's a great need in the earth. And I believe God is preparing some people to feel that need. Amen? Amen. Well, without further ado, thank you for uh, giving me that moment to share a little bit. Um, I want to go ahead and get into the Word. Just a little bit of reading for you. Um, we're going to be in Daniel chapter number 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 4 and then skip to verse number 6. We'll read two verses from Ezekiel chapter 1. And then we're going to read a little bit from John 21. And we'll get into the preach message from there. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 1. I'm reading from the New King James. Starting at verse number 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God, small g. Then the king instructed Af uh, Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Verse number six says, Now from among those sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. On the fifth day of the month, <clears throat> which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Tibar. In the land, and, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. John chapter 21, starting at verse 17. And he, being Jesus, said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, what did he say? Feed my sheep. Then Jesus says this. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wish, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify. Everybody say glorify. Glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, good old Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. If I will that he stay till I come, that is none of your concern. You follow me. I want to minister from the thought, um, alignment to assignment. This is part two. And for a subtopic, I want to take the thought, the catastrophe of comparison. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the opportunity to minister to your word. Speak through me right now that your people will be edified. And it is in your name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the house. Comparison kills. 
comparison is a killer. I think there are, all, are, there are very few contexts where comparison doesn't take something away from somebody. Whether by murder, whether by suicide, comparison is a killer. Comparison sets, in my opinion, unrealistic expectations. And it's said that comparison is the thief of joy. And therefore, these unrealistic expectations, and they, they put a weight, the weight of these expectations steal the joy from a person. And that weight can also crush a person from the inside out. When you think of crushing, you actually think of crushing physically from the outside in. But, but comparison, when it sets unrealistic expectations and the weight of those joy-stealing expectations, they crush you from the inside out. Now, this type of crushing is common in every area of life. But I think it's, it's, it's probably most often seen in the sports world. In during the, the draft, whether it's the NBA or the NFL, the, the experts, quote unquote experts, have what's called as a, a, a pro comparison or a pro comp. And what they would say to this young person that's, that's trying to come into the professional ranks, they would say that this person reminds me of this professional player or this person reminds me of this Hall of Fame player. And the problem with that, the problem with that is that that player comparison can stick to a person and be used against them if anything happens that does not meet expectations. If you are a 90s basketball fan, you may remember the name Harold Miner. Harold Miner had the nickname Baby Jordan. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He had the nickname Baby Jordan. He went to Southern Cal, and he was incredibly skilled. The name actually came from him in high school the way he played the game and how athletic he was. And, and he was drafted in 92. And obviously his player comparison was none other than Michael Jordan. Now, Harold Miner won two dunk contests, but his career didn't line up at the onset to look like Mike. Mike, as a rookie, averaged 28. Harold Miner didn't do that as a rookie. And because his nickname was Baby Jordan, he could never meet those expectations. And then injuries set in. And by the age of 25, he was drafted in 92. By 1996, at the age of 25, injuries had taken his career. In an interview, he said he had to take time away from the game. He had to detox from the game of basketball. He was disappointed with the way things went. He also said in an interview, that that nickname and that comparison, Baby Jordan, it brought him into stardom. And it brought him into spotlight. But he was always uncomfortable with the spotlight. His coach at USC, George Raveling, said, I always felt the worst thing to happen to Harold was the Baby Jordan tag. Why? Because comparison kills. There's a quote that says, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its entire life thinking it's stupid. The same thing is in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 uses the body as a literal metaphor. And it talks about the ear can't say to the foot or the hand can't say to the foot, I have no need of thee. If a finger compares itself to an ear and judges itself by its ability to hear, that finger will always trip up trying to glorify God in a way it was never intended to. See, comparison in John chapter 17 almost tripped up Peter. And I love Peter. I love that God gives us Peter's example because Peter is real. He real. And I'm not talking about real in just a, a, a common vernacular he, his journey represents the journey of following Christ and how it can be up and down. And so what we find in John 21 is that 
Jesus is restoring Peter into right relationship with him. See, Peter was out of alignment. When they arrested Jesus and Peter was like, you know, Jesus, I'll die for you. Jesus, I'll go. Peter wasn't about that dying for Jesus' life, right? Peter denied him three times. And it grieved Peter. So Peter was in this place of being out of alignment with his relationship with Jesus And Jesus is now restoring him. Now, isn't it just like it when you're, I don't know if you've ever been out of alignment. There was a season in my life where I was out of alignment. I was running from God. And, and, and and when I finally got back into alignment, I I was, I was, I was still, you know, I knew I was where I was supposed to be, but you know, your, your God is restoring you, but you're still a little sensitive. You know, you, you, God is restoring you, but you, you're still a little touchy. I remember the first time I grew up singing in the choir, and I didn't do that all through college, and I finally joined the, co- joined the choir at Anderson Grove. And my first day of practice, somebody just rubbed me the wrong way, Sister, Sister Lakeisha. They said I was sitting in their seat. The first, you know, cause you're trying to get back into alignment, right? And, and when you try to get back into alignment, stuff like that happens. To try to get you to walk back out the door. But, 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 but what happens in John 21 is not people rubbing Peter the wrong way. It's Jesus. Jesus is poking him. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter is in a broken state. And the beauty of brokenness is that that's what's needed to get you back into alignment. When your heart is broken, he said a broken heart and a contrite spirit, I will by no means despise. So the conversation that got the brokenness in Peter was necessary to get him back into alignment. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, most assuredly, if you have a King James, it says, verily, verily. And there was some, if if you've been under the ministry, if you haven't been, Bishop did this teaching years ago about verily, verily. Mother Lula, I don't know if you remember this. He said, whenever you see verily, verily in the scriptures, that means pay attention. Whenever, so the, the new King James says most assuredly, the King James says verily, verily. He says, verily, verily, I say to you, when you were young, you went where you wanted. But when you're old, they're going to take you to a place where you don't want to go. Jesus was telling Peter about how his assignment was going to end. And when Peter heard that, Peter didn't like that word. Let's talk church. Have you ever been in those prophetic lines? And you're there with your brother, sister, and you hear the prophetic word that they get? And you're like, ooh, God, let me get some of that. You heard people, I don't know, just reach up and grab it. You can't reach up and grab everything. Because, because, because. Everything actually is not for you. Glory to God here. So, 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 so Peter gets a prophetic word from Jesus telling him how he's going to die and his death is going to glorify Jesus. But Peter didn't like that word. And what does Peter start to do? He starts to compare. Hold up, Jesus. What's going to happen to me? What about him? God Almighty. He heard the word of the Lord, but didn't like it, and immediately he started comparing to the next disciple. The thing about comparison is this. Comparison in that moment omitted that what Jesus said to Peter was about how Peter was going to glorify God. What Jesus said to Peter had nothing to do with John. It had everything to do with Peter's assignment and how Peter's assignment and at the end of it was going to glorify God. So his comparison was a waste of energy because it had nothing to do with anybody else around him. It was about how Peter was going to glorify God. So... What does comparison do? Comparison omits context. Everybody say context. See, 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 in in the first part of this, I talked about the sequence, the alignment sequence for, uh, 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 for your assignment. And the sequence is calling purpose and assignment. And these things are, these three things are connected, but, but they're not the same. And 
And we said earlier that calling can be attached to a specific place or a specific people. And that place or those people help to provide the context. And the context of your assignment is how God gets the glory. If you think about what we talked about with a finger versus an ear, glory to God, the context of a finger has nothing to do with hearing. Glory to God. So if a finger continues to try to hear, the finger will never glorify God because that's not the finger's context. The context of your assignment is how God gets the glory. If Jonah would have went to go preach anywhere else except Nineveh, God would not have gotten the glory because his context was Nineveh. So you've got to know the context of your assignment if God is going to get the glory out of your life. Now calling is so much bigger then work. I don't have the time to get into itemizing this thing, but I want you to understand that when you talk about calling, calling is, is so much bigger than the work that we think about. When, when Ephesians 4 says you want to make your, your, uh, your, your calling and your, inv- your, your, your vocation, you want to walk worthy of the vocation in which you're called, that's talking about the work that you're called to. But calling is so much bigger than that. Calling is, it, it can be categorized into identity, relationship, lifestyle, inheritance. The Bible says you're called into holiness. He said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but I called sinners into repentance. You're called into fellowship with his son. Those are things for everybody. Every believer can, can access or are called into those things when you accept Jesus Christ. But today, we're focusing on the vocational, the spiritual vocational calling of God. According to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 1, where it leads into the calling or the, the discussion of the fivefold ministry. And how the fivefold ministry, their, their assignment is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And I believe that God wants everybody equipped and everybody understanding the context of their assignment because of the the day that we're living in. Night is coming when no man can work. And it's time for us to get into action and fulfilling what God told us to do. Now the thing with this is that you can't appoint yourself to something. You've got to be called to it. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, it uses the, the, the picture of the high priest of the Old Testament. and talks about what the high priest does and how the high priest has to walk in compassion and offer gifts and sacrifices. Hallelujah. But the Bible says that in verse number 4 that no one can choose this honor for himself. It's only those to whom God has called. It's an honor to serve God. But it's an honor that you have to be called to and in the context of kingdom kingdom work, whatever your work is, whatever that thing is, God wants you to be called to that work. But here is the issue that we want to deal with today. Too many times in the body of Christ, we look at people with similar calls. And when we look at them, sometimes we make the foolish mistake Of attempting to apply their context to our calling. We we attempt to apply someone else's context to our calling, purpose, and assignment. And this is the trap of comparison. Glory to God. We read from Daniel and Ezekiel today. I want to move forward here. These are some of my favorite areas of study. When I'm in the word, I love studying the connection between these two. Daniel and Ezekiel are two of four so-called major prophets. Now, the, the, the thing about them, the other two are Isaiah and Jeremiah. And, and Isaiah exists at one time. And then years later, here comes Jeremiah. And at the end of Jeremiah's journey, both Daniel and Ezekiel come into play. The unique thing about them is that they both exist at the same time. They are ministering during what's called the Babylonian captivity. And during this time, 
God calls Babylon to be the world power for 70 years. If you are a historian, you've heard of the battle of Carchemish. And at this battle, God allowed Babylon to smack Assyria and smack down Egypt. And Egypt never even left their borders after that battle. And the Bible speaks of this in multiple chapters that the king of Egypt wouldn't come out of his land after he lost his fight to Nebuchadnezzar. Now what we read in Daniel chapter number one is that during this time King Nebuchadnezzar went to Jerusalem and he took what he wanted he on the in the third year of King uh, Jehoiakim he went down there besieged Jerusalem because he was in the pathway of beating down Egypt he was chasing them back to their homeland he said you know what I see Jerusalem I want it for myself I'm going to take what I want I'm going to take the people I want and they're going to go back to Babylon what we read is that Daniel and his boys are in the group of people that were taken back to Babylon. Now watch this. About eight or nine years later, Nebuchadnezzar came back to Jerusalem and he did it again. He snatched some more people. This time he snatched Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a priest. He's starting to work in the temple. He's about to come into his next level calling according to the priesthood. Glory to God. Because Ezekiel was not yet 30. At the age of 30, he could do everything in the temple. But before he can do everything, here comes Nebuchadnezzar. He just said, I'm going to snatch this boy. I'm going to snatch these people. And I'm going to take them back with me. Now they're in captivity. But God's calling is not voided. They're in captivity. They're no longer in Jerusalem. They're no longer in Judah. But God said, I'm going to call these two boys And they're going to prophesy. But they are both prophets. But their context is different. Watch this. By the time Ezekiel gets there. Daniel had already completed three years at the University of Babylon. By the time Ezekiel gets there, Daniel had already had his life threatened because Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. But Daniel had already prayed. Daniel and his boys already got the interpretation. They got the dream and the interpretation by the time Ezekiel got there Daniel was already promoted in the kingdom now why am I saying it like this because when Ezekiel gets there he probably hears that there's a Jewish brother that's on the top ranks in Babylon it would be foolish for Ezekiel to look at Daniel and say oh I want what Daniel has I want to get where he is because he doesn't understand the context nor does he understand the cost so Ezekiel would be out of his mind to compare himself to Daniel even though Daniel has a prophetic grace and Ezekiel has a prophetic calling their contexts are different comparison will kill the assignment on Ezekiel if he's looking at Daniel wanting to be Daniel just like Jesus told Peter what is that to you you follow me we got to stop operating in comparison. Get on your face. Get in the face of God. Find out what Jesus is saying to you. And you follow him. Now on Daniel's side, Daniel loved his people. Daniel, the Bible says, prayed towards Jerusalem three times a day. He interceded for Jerusalem, for for Israel in Daniel chapter number 9. But I want to point something out to you. God never gave Daniel a prophetic word for Israel. Ooh, that's messing with you. I promise. If you do a word search on the book of Daniel, you'll see the name Israel in there four times only. Three of them are in chapter number 9. In all the visions that Daniel got, God never spoke to him about Israel. Now, what can get Daniel tripped up? Because Israel was Ezekiel's calling. Israel, the Bible says, it shows us that Ezekiel spoke about, or the Lord spoke to him about Israel over 170 times in 37 different chapters. Why? Because it was Ezekiel's 
assignment. Daniel's assignment wasn't Ezekiel's assignment. God help me. It, it, see, Ezekiel, the Bible says that God said, I'm sending you to a people that you, you're not going to somebody who doesn't have your speech. Daniel, glory to God, Daniel had to speak to people who didn't know his language. Daniel was elevated in the, in the kingdom of Babylon and therefore every other nation that Babylon had overtaken, he had to speak to people that he wasn't familiar with. So Ezekiel comes into play and God tells him, if I sent you to people of, from, of unfamiliar speech, they would listen to you. But no, I'm sending you to the house of Israel. I'm sending you to my children I'm telling you to I'm going to tell you what to say and you're going to tell them why because that's your assignment Ezekiel glory to God it's not your assignment to do what Daniel does and Daniel I know you love Israel I know you pray for them but the words I'm giving you have nothing to do with them why because that's someone else's assignment I need you to prophesy to kings I need you to speak to Nebuchadnezzar I need you to speak to Cyrus I need you to speak to kings and kingdoms I need to show you what's going to happen a couple hundred years from now don't worry about them I've got someone else on assignment. Don't you compare with yourself knowing that Ezekiel is talking to your people. He's got my assignment on his life. You stay in yours. You can get caught up comparing and wanting to do what someone else is doing. And it doesn't even mean that you're a bad person it means that you're human. It can happen to any human being. And what I believe God is wanting to reel us in, he wants to reel you in from a bad expectation. He wants to reel you in from expecting things to go one way when he's calling you to, be, to do it a different way. So many times when you hear about somebody called, we lock it into certain things and we only teach certain things and we have to break out of the box. We've got to do more to prepare people for what God is saying. Glory to God, do you realize that the rite of passage in a lot of African American churches is that every child has to go through the children's choir. It's a rite of passage. Everybody has to do it. But how does that prepare somebody that's not called to sing? How does that prepare somebody whose assignment has nothing to do with the choir? We have to break our thinking. We have to think differently. We have to get in God's face and say, God, how do I prepare them for what you said? Because if they grow through life thinking that their calling is only about the choir, only about preaching in the pulpit, then those children will not understand the calling, purpose, and assignment on their life. You got parents trying to get their children active, but their children are like, I don't want to, I don't sing, mommy. I don't dance, daddy. I don't do all of these things, but that's the only out that they see. They're comparing themselves and thinking they don't have it because they don't do upfront stuff. But the devil is a liar. We are in a place of empowering people to live in their identity, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We are in a place of equipping the saints. Everybody, lot and dotty, everybody. We're going to fulfill our calling. We're going to walk in purpose. You're going to know your assignment. We're not going to compare. We're not going to look to the right, to the left. It don't mean nothing to me. I'm going to rejoice for you. As you walk out your assignment, I'm going to rejoice. But I'm not going to be jealous. I'm not going to be envious. I'm going to rejoice and be glad. I'm going to bless God for you while I walk out my assignment. It doesn't have to look like everybody. It's got to look like what God said. Yeah. 
you may never grace this pulpit. Doesn't matter. It's your assignment. You may never lead a song. It doesn't matter. It's your assignment. Comparison is killing people in the spirit. You think the only way that you can serve is through the things that we see. The problem is we have so much, so many things in the church that look like entertainment. And if you may have heard of the, the seven mountain theory, the seven mountain teaching, and one of the mountains is entertainment. And we think in context of that in the church because there are so many things that we do, some of them just applications of wisdom. But it can train your mind to think that it has to be a certain way. It has to be a certain way. It has to look like this. And it doesn't. I believe that God is playing chess right now. And if you would take your eyes off of what you think it's supposed to be, he will position you in his board for his glory. Going back to Peter and John. And I'm going to wind this up here. Peter was the first person to preach a sermon. It wasn't John. It wasn't John. John was there. It was Peter that God used on the day of Pentecost. But if Peter is looking at John, Peter will be out of alignment and he will miss that moment. Peter got the opportunity to glorify God and thousands of people came to Christ in a day. Do you know what God, what Jesus told John about his first assignment? It was, son, behold thy mother, mother, behold thy son. He told John that Mary is no longer going to be in that position as my mother. Now you take care of her because I got to go. John's first assignment was to take care of Mary. But Peter didn't know because he was out of alignment. John's anointing didn't kick in till years later. That's when we get the book of Revelation. That's when we get the gospel of John in first, second, and third. It was decades later. But Peter, what is that to you? I'm calling out people. If you're sitting on your assignment because of comparison, know who you are. The assignment it's such a small, it's an important piece, but it's the smallest part of all the things you're called to. He calls you his son and daughter. He calls you into fellowship with his son. He calls you into blessing. This is for every believer. Every believer may not do the specific work. But every believer is called into sonship and holiness and his kingdom don't let comparison kill the assignment inside of you because it's valuable to God and God wants to get glory from you in the context of your assignment glory to God why don't you stand to your feet If you've never given your life to Christ, whether you're here in the sanctuary, whether you're viewing online, I invite you to give your life to Christ. It's all about him. He's calling you not just to do something. You'll find that out. But he's calling you because he wants you. He's calling you into eternal life. What we do is all about Jesus. If you're viewing online, please text WVICC Connect to the number 94,000. Salvation, prayer, membership. If you want to be baptized, 
water baptism, baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire, whatever it is, we want to serve and minister to you. If you're a person that knows you're out of alignment, this is your day. If you're a person that struggles with comparison, I know I've struggled with comparison. A lot of this is deliverance for me. Comparison can stick it on me. You're going to hell. It, it's, it's just hampering your walk. You're limping when you should be sprinting because you're putting a standard on yourself that the Lord never put on you. You're saying, well, I don't look like this. Or I don't dress like this. So what? If that's you, I would love to pray with you. there's anyone struggling with comparison I pray that you speak to their heart about how much you love them how much they are fearfully and wonderfully made there's nothing else to compare themselves to other than your standard on their life <clears throat> you've given us your spirit to do everything that we need to do and we love you I pray a fresh outpouring of your spirit on your people. Even as fresh as the precipitation we're receiving, I pray a fresh outpouring, a gentle outpouring of your spirit to refresh them even now. That they are yours and their assignment matters. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you put your hands together as we get ready to take communion. We are at the end of our service and our Mother Monroe is going to come up after this. I'm going to go ahead and do communion. We're going to give announcements in the offering. Glory to God. Glory to God. You can keep that going, Walter. At that table, the Bible says that Jesus took bread and he blessed it. He blessed and he broke. He said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. same moment he took the cup and said this cup represents the blood of the new covenant without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins he said this is my blood shed for you and for the remission of the sins of many and he says take and drink ye all of it Glory to God. And as is our custom, let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Mother Monroe, let's give God some glory one more time. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Thank you for that powerful sermon. I'm going to say a little words on it after announcement so that you can go out, not necessarily with announcements on your mind, but the statement about comparison on your mind. You may be seated for our announcements. We have our Bible study each Wednesday night at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Please join us for 
the expounding of the Word of God. Our next announcements, women's ministry, these are ongoing announcements every fourth Saturday here at the church. Sometimes, other times, we're venturing out into other locations. So please be aware of supporting our women and inviting others to come to support the women's ministry every fourth Saturday. We have 6 a.m. prayer. There is a call, there is a number on the screen, 605-313-4835, and the access code is 615-183-POUNDS. So join us at 6 a.m. in the morning for prayer, Monday through Friday. Our next announcement, high school graduation. Uh, there will be meeting on Sunday, March the 19th. <coughs> So if you have a graduate that um, needs to make a contact with Dr. B, please make sure that that happens. So proud of our graduates. New members orientation will be held on March 23rd via Zoom at 7 o'clock. If you are a new member joined at any time and have not been through the orientation, we invite you to uh, notify the church and uh, get signed up for that class. There will be a panel discussion here with Pastor Jerome Gray, Jr., Jerome Gay, Jr., on March 29th in the Family Life Center at 6 p.m. Uh, discussing Church Hurt. He is the author of a book called Church Hurt. Let's remember we are trying to prepare for a family directory starting this week coming up, March 14th through the 16th. There are some available slots. First uh, shooting will be at 10.30. First photography shooting will be at 2.30, and it will go until 7 p.m. So please try the link and get yourselves registered so we can match names with faces in the form of a church directory. That concludes our announcement. Say amen. amen. Govern yourselves accordingly. Now you may stand, and we're going to dismiss. There are some points that... Uh, I receive from this message alignment to your assignment or alignment in your assignment. So I want you to look at somebody that can either read your lips or hear your voice and say, get aligned to your assignment. Comparison and judgment and getting in uh, God's lane to tell people what they should and should not do is not good. I remember him talking about the children and how they had to go through the ranks. I had to do that myself of an usher. And then you got in the choir. And then you may have uh, hid eggs for Easter. And then you did this before you can get in a rank. And though they meant well, but I was sitting there thinking, get out of God's lane. I still believe that you can call people into areas that they may not see but I'm asking God to give us witty creations for knowing what else is it in the church. We've got so many children who are so skilled in technology. Why can't they run the camera? Why can't they check the mic in the morning? I remember sitting my son on a drum stool every Sunday and he learned how to play the drum and I didn't have to pay Pearson Music School. People sat on pews of the organ and watched the organist and learned how to play an organist because they were gifted. We've got to put them in positions and always have a Timothy. So when you leave today, say after me, get in alignment for your assignment. If you have breath in your body, you've got an assignment. And I promise you it's not to warm up you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, let us get up off our seat of do nothing and get busy for the kingdom, God. Whatever it is from A to Z, God, you have ordained it for such a time as this. Speak to us, Lord. Let us know what else we could do. Some of us are doing one thing, two things, three things, but we can stretch to do even more. So I pray blessings over this congregation, blessings over people who are watching. I pray, pray blessings over those who have the ear to hear. For the Bible said, he who has an ear, let him hear. In the name of Jesus, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Go in peace.